pleasure to uh, be introducing our, our keynote address. Uh, the title of it, of the keynote address, is Possibilities and Responsibilities, the Unique Contribution of Social Workers and Social Service Workers. And it's my very big pleasure to introduce our keynote presenter, Linda Jackson. Linda is the Vice President of Residential, Community and Brain Health at Baycrest. She's a social worker and health administrator who has had a focus in geriatrics and the integration of care, research and education. Linda is currently leading the implementation of several health transformation system projects, including Behaviour Support for Seniors Initiative for the Toronto Central Lynn, chairing a cross-sector quality table, and is the executive sponsor for one of the health links in Toronto. Linda has been an active volunteer on numerous community boards and is currently the board chair of Sprint Senior Care. Linda is the past recipient of the Inst Inspirational Social Work Leader Award from the Ontario Association of Social Work and is a graduate from Renison College, Wilfrid Laurier University and the Rotman Advanced Health Leadership Program at University of Toronto. In the interest of full disclosure, and although the choice of Linda as this year's keynote speaker rested with the AMED Advisory Committee, I was absolutely delighted with their choice because I must confess that one of the stellar achievements of my career was to have the good sense to hire Linda at Sunnybrook Health Science Centre more years ago than either of us would want to admit. As a result, I have had the good fortune to call her a valued colleague and friend for over 20 years. Please help me in welcoming Linda Jackson. Good morning. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to stand before such a distinguished audience of social workers and social service workers. And just for those of you who are wondering why Beatrice couldn't see everybody who was standing uh, by the mic microphones, there's these bright lights that are shining right in, in our faces, so uh, just to let you know that. Um, for this morning's talk, I would invite you to just sit back and bask in the fine company that you are in today. You are in person and online with a group of more than 500 colleagues who totally understand you. <laughs> Doesn't happen that often. This is a group who share your passion for change and social justice, and a group who, like you, are committed to ethical decision making. I hope over the next little while and dur during the day that you might take a little bit of time to rekindle or re uh, remind yourself of a spark that led you to your current role as a social worker or social service worker, and that you leave today with a firmer resolve of the reasons that you are committed to the field and that you're excited by the opportunities that lay ahead. So I have the privilege of working, as, as, as Glenda said, in an organization that employs many social workers. And I'm, I'm even more fortunate in the fact that I work in a place that, where social workers are in very important clinical roles, but they're also in many pivotal roles outside of the traditional social work pro professional practice group. I was just looking around recently and realized that our head of professional practice is a social worker, one of the executive directors in charge of mental health is a social worker, um, and, and I'm a social worker. Um, as such, it's not surprising that each year a group of social workers at Baycrest take time to acknowledge each other's contribution and social work contribution to the organization and to healthcare during Social Work Week. So during the last Social Work Week, I ran into a colleague who said, asked me if I still considered myself a social worker. And I, I, of course, I just kind of haphazardly said, of course I consider myself a social worker. Um, and and she, she wondered because I'd actually moved into an administrative uh, position. So although my, my response was kind of uh, a quick, this, this kind of chance encounter has, uh, has made me ask a lot of questions for myself. It, it made me pause to reflect on myself, 
and other social workers and the profession. And a few questions came to mind. What does it take to consider yourself a social worker or, or a social service worker? Is it our job or is it part of our identity or both? So I think that most people who know me guess very much that I identify as a social worker. When I'm asked what I do for a living, I state that I'm a social worker. I might comment that I focused in healthcare and administration, but the first thing that comes to mind is that I'm a social worker. When I'm asked at the border what I do for a living or on a duty form on a plane, <laughs> I put down that my profession or employment is as a, as a social worker. If I'm at a government or Lynn table representing my organization, I, I identify myself as a social worker. I'm even brave enough to make this response when asked at, at a cocktail party. <laughs> <laughs> or a school hallway, or with my kids' friends. So by and large, people who know me in my work and my personal life also know that, that my, my identity is, is very clearly as a social, work, social worker. So people at tables know that I bring my biases and I bring my strengths, but they can't come even though I have many different roles as a social worker. A colleague of mine who just moved to healthcare from a career at Queen's Park shared with me recently that he loves working with social workers since they see, he's not a social worker, he's, they, they see the broad picture and are great at breaking down and solving complex problems. Another colleague of mine just randomly recently who is the director of food services commented to me that she loves having social work leaders as, at, at the table because they're great team members. Um, and they always frame solutions and issues, keeping the client at the center. I've spent a lot, lot of my, time, my, my career in healthcare, and I've noticed that sometimes hospital administrators and others get frustrated with social workers. <laughs> we, we sometimes stubbornly advocate for the interests of our clients, and sometimes we don't actually reference the larger, the, the larger bigger picture. I know that in my role as a healthcare leader, I use my social work skills and knowledge every single day. And that I continue to be motivated by the people who look to social work and social service workers for support. I've also learned over time, and you probably have too, to advocate effectively so others will hear my concerns and understand what I'm advocating for. If you're constantly saying the same thing loudly and not listening, I've found that people don't always hear you and you have to use yourself a little differentially. So this chance encounter with my colleague and these two additional comments that just came about social work has made me think a lot about the opportunities and the possibilities and some of the long-standing challenges that our, our, our discipline faces. What is the unique identity that we share as a group of social work and social service workers? How has our history shaped us into the group that we are today? What's our unique contribution to the people we serve? And why is it that we tend to be quite reluctant to wear our collective identity as a badge on our sleeve? And finally, why is it that we are engaged in such important work but many of us have a really hard time explaining to others what it is that we do. <laughs> Are you comfortable telling everyone that you know that you're a social worker or a social service worker? Why, why not? Are you brave in a school hallway at a cocktail party? Do you find yourself using other terms that seem to be, have, have a greater status? Marriage counselor, psychotherapist, policy advisor. It's okay to be registered with the, with the, uh, uh, the, the psychotherapy um, college, but I think remind people that you're a social worker for, for, uh, for, for foremost. Finally, do we spend too much of our time telling others what we, what we do rather than just demonstrating our action and finding our collective voice? I actually think that we're at a pivotal time in our, uh, in our history and that we really need to celebrate our past and seize the many, many opportunities and possibilities that lie ahead. I think in order to be, continue to be relevant, we're gonna also have to get a little more savvy as a discipline. The world we, living it, we live in is changing rapidly, and I think we need to change with it. We are a profession that is particularly interested in individual and community stories. 
I believe that that genuine interest in stories is actually what sets us apart from other disciplines and professions working in micro, meso, and macro set settings. I think these stories help us to understand the child, the family, the senior that we work with individually. They're the stories that, when told together, bring groups together. And they're the stories that define communities and stories that inform the policies that we develop. I have a feeling that most of you are very rich in friends and family members who are drawn to you. You are probably genuinely interested in their stories and life issues, even when it isn't your official role as, as, as a social worker or social service worker. I also think we have a lot to be proud of our, of our collective story of social work and social service in Canada. And it's an important story that, that puts us together. By looking at our story and becoming part of the story, we can create a, a powerful future. Briefly, the social work story in Canada is now more than 100 years old. And it's quite compelling. I wonder if the social service workers who were doing these first early home visits had trouble defining what it was that they were doing. At that time, their main role was to help people and communities in need. And as you probably know, social work emerged from the efforts of local citizens responding to the needs of their neighbours. Industrial capitalism in the 1800s created misery for many people who migrated to urban areas in search for work. And the effect of industrialization led to many social problems, including deplorable housing conditions, diseases, poor health and unemployment, and poverty. As I was researching for this talk today, I came across a research study from 1887. I had to check that I got it right. I thought maybe it was actually giving me the wrong, dec the wrong uh, years. But it was a research study on poverty by Herbert Ames. And in that study, it found in 1887 that men in poverty were willing to work. And if they were given this chance, they felt that their entire family's quality of life would improve. Sound familiar today? I think Herbert Ames was also an incredible example of an early social service worker. He inherited his family shoe bit company, but used much of his fortunes to help the poor and fight corruption. He received a, a Bachelor of Arts degree from Amherst College in 1885. Can you believe that? He helped organize the Volunteer Electoral League, became an alderman in Montreal, and a member of, the, of Parliament and a financial director for the National League of Nations. And he authored a book, The City Below the Hill, a sociological study of a portion of the city of Montreal, Canada. He also gave back tremendously. He was an avid philanthropist and funded a 39-unit apartment complex in downtown Montreal. These major social issues were critical to the development of early settlement housing movement and the development of the charitable organiz organizational society. To, the, to those of you who are women in the crowd, and as I see it, we're still the predominant gender in this profession <laughs> from looking from here, you might find it interesting to note that way back when, this form of social work and social service work was actually seen as an acceptable role for women. Not all work was. Apparently, this charitable work was deemed acceptable, acceptable because it was seen as an extension of the women's caring role at home. Some things don't change. At the same time, concerns about neglect and delinquent children arose. This led to the development of the Society for the Protection of Women and Children in 1881. The first Children's Aid Society, located in Toronto, was established in 1891. How many of you work for child welfare now? Isn't that amazing, your history? 1891, the first Children's Aid Society in, in Toronto. Many of our early leaders were also involved in various philanthropic religious societies supported by members of the Jewish, Anglican, Presbyterian, and Methodist community. 
This eventually led to the creation of the Social Service Council of, of Canada, the formation of trades and labour and Congress groups, and pivotal legislation including the Workers' Compensation Act and the Pensions Act. This past 100 years is filled with examples of social workers and social service workers committed to making a difference related to social and economic change. And at the same time, there was an increasing focus on our professional status. We have a provincial association, a Canadian association, the College of Social Work and Social Service, professional social work schools, and many are reaching pivotal milestones. It happens to be this year. CSW, CASW, our Canadian uh, body, was formed in 1926. OASW, as referenced previously, is celebrating 50 years. The College of Social Work will be reaching its 15th uh, year next year and has, think about that, more than 16,000 members. And that's just in Ontario, of social workers and social service workers. As I was looking at, uh, again, as I was doing some research, I, I came across some stats from the United States and I was a bit astounded when I realized that there's 650,000 registered social workers in the United States. And that is the largest mental health professional group in the country. It's a huge amount. The first Canadian School of Social Work was established in Toronto in 1914, so they're also coming up to their 100th year. McGill is in 1918. And now there are more than 13 schools of social work in Ontario and in Toronto. And social service programs are also well developed in, in, in Ontario, with more than 100 different programs offered with a variety of focuses uh, with different colleges. I I'm not sure we're, we're, we're leveraging our collective strength as social workers and social service workers. I think we rarely come together and I really appreciated the comments that were made this morning and I think that the, that the ideas actually rest with a group like us in terms of how we want to take that collective together. Finally, the Family Service Association, anybody here work for Family Service Association? I did previously too. Um, is 100 years, they're celebrating their 100th year as well. This, this month, and they're a great organization who have been employing social workers and social service workers for that full 100 years. So as we've developed these institutions, we've also engaged in a lot of efforts to make sure we know what it is we do. I was looking on the, on the website around different examples of us trying to figure out what it is that we do. Here's a word salad, I think they're called that, something like that, that's put together on social services competence, development, social service work, ethical, commitment. There's one for social work. Family, together, inspired, help. Every year we have a different poster that tells us about what social workers do. Social workers change futures. It's one advertising for social service programs. with many different uh, uh, categories, advocacy, com community development, education. Social workers, we strengthen lives through solutions. We're solution focused. The social service couch. Tell me how you feel. More about social work, relationships, dignity, worth, rights. And what's, what's a profession if you don't have a cartoon? It's always interesting when you actually hear about social work in, uh, in, uh, in here. It says, if you can't see it, the social worker just called, she's on her way over, as they say in panic. I particularly liked this one, and so did my children. Uh, do... <laughs> Although when I bring my kids to work, what they can't believe at work is I actually that my mother voice, <laughs> which is different than my social work voice. <laughs> And don't worry, keep calm. Uh, we, we were in a room of, 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 of social workers. So there are just a few examples, but as I was preparing this address, I also thought it would be interesting. I've been graduated for many years, more than the 20 years that I've, I've known uh, Glenda. And I, I thought, you know, I wondered if things had changed. Um, I could remember the reasons that brought me into the profession. And I thought I'd ask some newer members of the profession and people who had, had been working for a while, for the reasons that, th that they came into the field and what keeps them going. It was very interesting. 
My conversations confirm that it's not status that comes with the profession, but rather a, com a common goal to make a difference in the lives of people we serve, the communities that we, that we support, and the, the world we lived in. It was quite interesting to hear people say time and time again that that's what kept them going um, as social workers. They wanted to make a difference. Something generally with most people that I talked with, the, with the newer uh, uh, professionals, something had twigged for them in their, as they were growing up or, or in their life that made them want to actually give back. Every single social work I spoke to, and I spoke to many, said this in one way or another. So I discovered that not much has changed in this regard, and I was kind of glad. So let's just for a little while look ahead. Where are we? Where should we focus for the next 100 years? It's hard to imagine, isn't it? So a few things stand out for me, and this is not all inclusive. We're a very diverse audience, and many of you could take this in different directions, but I thought I'd, I'd pull out a few themes that I, I could see that we should probably be thinking about. Globalization, an aging population, technology and innovation, and a question about our professional identity versus our attention to social issues. The world is growing and there are significant social issues that are glaring us in the face, both locally and around the world. How do you connect? How can we connect our 15,000, 16,000 social workers and social service workers in Ontario, across Canada and North America? How can we help countries that are just starting to develop social work programs? Did you know we're doing some work in China? And I was amazed that in China, there's, there's very few social workers in, in hospitals. Some colleagues of mine just came back from Abu Dhabi, and they said that the stigma that, it, that exists there with, for people with dementia is, is astounding, and the lack of formal programs that are available there. Just two little glimpses and when I was asking about what's the role of social work in these just different countries. Where is the social work presence in, in, in addressing issues like child labor in India and Pakistan and the inequities experienced in, within our uh, Aboriginal communities and at home? What about the significant environmental issues and the aging tsunami? I, I, I would be remiss as a leader at Baycrest if I didn't actually make a few comments about aging. I know that many of you are, are working in fields that aren't focused on aging, but I think that this is an issue that we all have to actually pay some attention to because it's, it's significant and it will impact you at one time or another, uh, no matter what area that you, that you work in. This is the statistics with regards to our aging population. The numbers are, 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 are pretty compelling. Currently, approximately 15% of the Canadian population is over 65, but these numbers just keep increasing with projections within the next 20 to 30 years that close to a quarter of our population will be over 65. This is the case across the, the world, in particular in Europe, Latin America, and the Caribbean, and Asia, where there's been slower growth but less supports to actually deal with a, a, an aging population. The other, part, the other issue that is rather staggering for me is that according to the World Health Organization, organization there are currently 35.6 million people around the world living with dementia. And the number is expected to double by 2030 and triple by 2050. A new case of dementia is diagnosed every four seconds across the world. My colleagues in brain research have shared with me that while there are many interventions to support people diagnosed with this chronic condition, we are in nowhere near a cure. We need to think of dementia as a chronic condition, similar to arthritis and heart disease, and support the many people and the many caregivers that will live with the disease in the future. As Dr. Rob McFadden recently urged at the Ontario Association of Social Work annual meeting, social workers seem to forget the bio and biopsychosocial, and have not fully embraced our, our, our role in understanding the brain and its tremendous impact in, on emotion. Those of you who have developed skills and understanding in mindfulness and will appreciate the power of the mind in, in managing many responses, anxiety, depression, and pain. Dr. McFadden urges us as social workers 
to start understanding the importance of the brain in our work. As a person who has worked in the aging field for a long time, I'd, I'd also like to say that I think that we have a lot to be excited about. One of the reasons that we're seeing such an increase in dementia is because, quite frankly, we're living longer all across the world. And this is largely because of improvements in the broad determinants of health that we've contributed to. Longer life has its benefits, and it has a few challenges. How many of you think you'll retire at age 65? Okay, there were three hands up, <laughs> so get ready. There's a change there. So we may retire earlier, <laughs> or older, but we may also live more than 30 years after our 65th birthday. The average age of the seniors I work with in our assistive living is 90. I fully engage in meaningful conversations with people over 100 on a weekly basis. Last week, I got a detailed email from a man I work with who's 102, who was at a meeting that I was at, and he wanted to comment on it. I kept that email, and I figure I'm going to keep it forever, because it was so eloquent, and I figure I am, I am the luckiest person that I get to actually talk to people that have that, th those many years of wisdom. So let me introduce you to Kitty Cohen. This is Kitty Cohen, and she lives in our assistive living uh, um, uh, building at, at Baycrest, and she threw out the first pitch. She's 101. And she threw out the first pitch at the Blue Jays game on Mother's Day. She was a little upset that they didn't let her run the bases. <laughs> Not to be outdone, this is Kitty doing the Princess Margaret um, walk for cancer that she does every year. Inspiring. So there's a lot to be very excited about in, in, in this field and something that we need to look at. I am, I'm, I'm, I'm still concerned that in many of our programs, I'm not sure if the social service workers have gotten it better than us social workers, we don't actually focus a lot on that part of the lifespan. That's going to be a larger part of our life. And we actually have to get people excited and understanding th th this piece because it's, it's a wonderful field. If you're new in the profession and, and you want to think about um, aging, I, I, I would be happy to, to talk to anyone. So social workers, uh, uh, social workers need to think about this, but I'm inspired very much. We are also one of the only G8 countries that doesn't have a dementia strategy, and I think we need to actually be focusing on, in that area as, as, way, uh, as well. So social work has made great advances in creating and researching best practice, practice relevant to our work. We will need to continue to develop competence in the area of quality and project evalu evaluation to keep relevant with our colleagues in other applied science fields. I find that others actually have a bit of an edge on us with that. We've made great advances in this regard, but sometimes we're still rather siloed as a discipline, with academics and researchers not as involved in day-to-day -day work, and clinical practice and clinical staff not as involved in, in posing the important research questions. We also, I think, need to get much more sophisticated when it comes to te technology. Some of you are ahead of others in this regard. So if, you're, if you were born in 1984 or beyond, could you stand up for a minute? You can stretch. 1984, okay, stand up. All right. So these people, they, so this little baby was also born in 1984. Okay, you can sit, sit down, that's great. Actually, it's probably the rest of us that need to actually get our circulation going, not you. <laughs> So these, these people that stood up are digital natives. They were born the, or, or the year or, 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 be, or after or before when the first computers were, were arrived. They know nothing else. This, these are, we call the digital natives. You've had access, you people that stood up, to a, computer, a computerized world since you were born. You know nothing else. You probably tweet, Twitter, Facebook, and you might blog. You might be doing it right now as well. <laughs> the rest of us, we're digital immigrants. <laughs> we needed to adapt to a changing world. And why is this relevant? Well, this can be a, a, a challenge or an opportunity. When I spoke to social workers, the other thing that they said, besides their commitment uh, to the work that they do, was that what was uniform was that people are pretty overwhelmed with their workload. Uh, if you can't see this one, it says, this is our latest case management system. We just uh, keep adding files until he falls over. 
we need to find new ways to actually manage this workload because the number of people, even though we have 16,000 social workers and social service workers, um, there's many, many more people that are going to be coming to us for service and the world is, is working much faster. So we, we have to find a, a way to actually make sure that our clinical settings and our policy settings and all of our settings are, 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 are ready for this digital world. Many of our digital, many of our clients are also digital natives. They come, they expect quick results, and they come armed with a ton of information that they can easily access online. They've probably already diagnosed themselves before they've come in. In healthcare, I'm seeing rapidly that we are, are that the world is changing. We are doing telehealth consultations around the world. This is kind of more the traditional setting. Um, we're, we're around the world. And some of my colleagues are, are conducting groups online and doing full treatment through online technology. I found that many social workers have been slower to adopt some of these new approaches. Many concerned about privacy and confidentiality. Others are, are grabbing it. I can tell you that nursing is starting to embrace technology. Any senior in Toronto being discharged from a Toronto hospital with a condition known as COPD over a certain age is now being offered telehome care, and the early results are very promising. It appears having someone reaching out to the home every day, even if it's through some technology, reduces the frequency of COPD symptoms and lessens the need for a hospital visit. The nurses are also finding that simply knowing that someone will be connecting reduces the anxiety and stress that frequently accompanies this condition. Another discipline that's been leading the pack on telehealth is psychiatry. There are very few psychiatrists in many parts of the province, and this is particularly the case for those in need of specialists focused on youth and, uh, and on seniors. Ontario Shores introduced a service a couple of years ago focused on youth who were presenting in an emergency room with a mental health distress. Have you ever seen a teenager in a, in a, in a, a waiting room and an emerge? They usually don't last more than 20 minutes. They figured that, that out. This, that, that this isn't a group. They've, they actually have offered them rapid access through telehealth. The same is true in geriatrics, where places like Baycrest are supporting primary care providers in areas where they cannot access psychiatry by either accessing the patient or the professional online. We've also introduced in our, in our setting telehealth in our long-term care home. If you work in long-term care, you know that actually there's not a lot of resources that actually are in the home. Uh, we now actually have a telehealth system where the nurse can contact a physician in the middle of the night. He logs onto his home computer. He can see the patient. He can check their heart rate. And he can actually see something like a wound that, that they've said is actually easier to see online than it is actually in person, um, that it works, that it works so, so well. We do have some super, superb leaders in this area. Dr. Rob McFadden, who I mentioned previously from U of T, and many of their colleagues are moving into the telehealth area. Elsa Marzielli, who pioneered some, some, uh, some pivotal on, online caregiver approaches. And Marilyn Hare, who, if you haven't met, is somebody that you should meet. She recently moved from CAMH to Centennial College, and she is definitely a digital immigrant who has embraced fully the world, world of technology. I would suggest that you connect to her blog, which is www.educaria.com. If anyone will intrigue you to consider the power of technology, she will. And I think she may also help us to bridge the divide between the university programs and the community college programs in her new role at Centennial as Chair of Community Services. In short, when it comes to technologies, our clients are going to expect us to fully utilize technology. and the needs will only increase. So where does that leave us today? We sure do have power in numbers, but I do believe that we don't always act as, as a collective. I hear the nursing voice, I hear some of the other voices, I rarely hear collectively our social work voice. I would urge us that we have to get involved with one another on the major issues confronting the individuals and communities that we serve. We have so much to offer. Volunteer in your community. I've always believed that we should do something outside of our work and inside of our work because we actually have so much to contribute at different tables and people will, will so much value that what, what you uniquely bring. So volunteer in your community, your association, your workplace, contribute those unique problem-solving skills. Let's also be much clearer 
about our un unique contribution and do this by demonstrating it in our place and in, of work and our social action. Let's not focus so much on trying to describe what it is that we do, just do it. And remind everyone as you go about doing it that it's your unique social work and social ser service skills and that passion in your belly that I know that we all have that, that, that keeps guiding you. Let's embrace the future. We need to find new tech-savvy approaches and anticipate the major social issues that will impact us, including the shifting demographics. We are experts in helping our clients deal with life changes, but we sometimes are not so good at that ourselves. What are you doing to build in this area? Are you the team member bringing new innovations to the table? Are you or are you the person reacting to the new innovations that someone else is bringing? Let's support our students and the new members of our profession, and let's support people that come from other countries who are bringing their skills and experiences and other countries that need our help. How knowledgeable are you around the, about the social issues occurring around the world, and how can you contribute in this world? How can we lend our professional ex expertise to, to those colleagues just beginning to develop? Our social work and social service history in this country is significant. And you are part of the story. But we don't have a compass for the future. I do believe that what will keep us going is the same thing that motivated those early social service workers. We still want to make a difference in the lives of the people in the communities we serve and ensure that the social policies are in place to accomplish this at a system level. We see hope when others see despair. And we see strength and resiliency in the face of adversity. Wear your title with pride and make sure that everyone who knows you knows that your, your unique skilled perspective comes because you're a social worker or a social service worker. I guess my answer to the colleague who asked me the question a few, few weeks ago is that yes, I still consider myself a social worker. I think I will be a, a social worker for the rest of my life. I believe that all of you are a part of an amazing group of men and women who do make an impact, one social worker and one social ser service worker at a time. I am incredibly proud and honored to count myself in your company. Thank you. Well, first, thank you. Uh, thank you for reminding us who we are, uh, why we got into this work. <laughs> Must be uh, contagious. And really challenged us to see the possibilities that exist in our future. I think um, if there's one thing uh, we sometimes forget to do, it's to see the positives. I, I think some of the work we do is incredibly difficult um, and it can uh, lead us to um, perhaps be more negative than we should be. And uh, especially when we consider um, all our skill base that you've reminded us of, uh, of this morning. Um, and as I say, I think challenging us to see the real possibilities in the future, which I think they're absolutely are, um, distinguishes us as, as social work and social service work professionals. Um, and uh, you mentioned that you got into this work to make a difference. It's happened. <laughs>